Hey, this is Tom McElroy with WildSurvivalSkills.com. In this video, I'm going to show you how to survive in an eastern woodland forest. For the next week, I'm going to be living off the land in the forest behind me with only my folding pocket knife. All right, my first thought is I need to get a shelter going. It definitely is dropping into the, the high 40s, low 50s at night, and it's raining a ton out here. So this is an area right here where there's a ton of material. I've got leaves, I've got um, downed trees, so everything I need is going to be within 100 feet of where I put my shelter. Alright, the first thing I'm going to do is make a really quick rib cage like structure by finding a really tall ridge pole. Angle it up so it's about crotch height. Then I'm going to prop it up by making a tripod by using two sticks that have a Y in the end and locking it in place. Okay, I've got the tripod set up. Now it's time to add the framework to this structure. I've already collected all the sticks, so this is going to go up. When you prop up the sticks, you don't want them poking above the ridge pole. If this happens, it allows rain to travel down the stick and drip into your shelter. What I have to do now is stuff the inside of the shelter with leaves. It's not enough to have leaves on the outside of the shelter. You need to be surrounded, so when you crawl in, you're burrowing into a mass of leaves above and below you. Now that I've got the basic frame going, what I'm going to do is to make an igloo-like doorway, where the doorway comes out the front. To do this, I pound some Y sticks into the ground like this, so these are nice and sturdy, and then I can lock in a cross piece here just by wedging it in against the ribs. Alright, to lock off the front and close off the front, I'm just going to find whatever I can, a bunch of sticks, and just lay them over the top. Again, this is nothing fancy. Before finishing my shelter, I'm going to spend a short amount of time getting water. To do this, I need a container. This recently fallen pine branch will be perfect. All right, so what I got to do first is skin this branch. I'm going to do that just by cutting across a perfect circle by wringing it with my knife. And I'm going to put a slice right down the top. And now I can peel the bark off. That's really important that when you peel this off, you do it as gently as possible because this needs to be a waterproof container. And if I put any breaks in it, it's done. And I just got to start over with another branch. Okay, so I'm going to fold up the edge just like this. Once I do that and I get it nice and the bark hasn't broke, I'm going to get my primitive clothespin, pry the parts that it wants to pinch together, and I'm going to clamp where my fingers are pulling together the corner of this basket. Here's the last one. I've got a stick that's split about halfway up and some bark wrapped at the top to stop that split. So this is your primitive clothespin. I'm gonna take that and spread it apart as much as I can with my fingers. And then I'm gonna take that and I'm gonna pinch it right where my fingers are holding this together. So now this container is gonna hold water because it has no breaks in it, only folds. All right, I got my pine bark uh, bowl done just by with pinching up the sides and now I need to find some pure water. To really purify a lot of water at the same time I need to get a fire going so that I can boil out and kill all the bacteria. For now I don't want to spend time doing that. What I want to do is to um, get back to my shelter as soon as possible. So what I can do is use this vine here, the wild grape vine. If I cut this vine it's going to start dripping absolutely pure water and I can stick my bucket under that and have a really great um, pure water to drink and it'll tide me over until I can start boiling large amounts of water on my own. But after a few hours it should fill this bowl. Alright, so the first thing I'm going to do is to scrape off all the bark and you can tell pretty much right away when I get rid of this bark it's going to start dripping with water. Now these will drip with water for a solid hour before they kind of gelatinize and basically uh, the cut on the area that you've done seals up and it stops dripping. So I'm going to get a good amount of water out of this, but it's not going to be a source that's going to last forever and ever. Luckily for me, there's a ton of these vines out here and then I can just walk over to the next one and fill up water. So if I had to, I could live off of this water if I never got a fire going out here. Ideally, I'm going to get a fire going and boil all the water I need. Okay, so what I'm going to do is a couple feet from the ground, I'm just going to start digging into this bark with my knife and creating a channel for that water to go down so it doesn't just haphazardly drip, but it actually drips exactly where I want it. And so if you can look out here, you'll see 
how much water is actually coming out of this vine, just from that little cut. So what I can do is put my bowl under there, let it collect water, come back in a couple hours, and that bowl will be almost full. Now, time to get to work covering my shelter frame in two and a half feet of piled debris. All right, now that I've got my shelter done, um, I've got enough leaves on top of it. I could still stuff more on the inside and then have a pile out here so that when I crawl in backwards, I plug this square entryway with as many leaves as I can, just like I'm, you know, corking a wine bottle. I need to have leaves all around me. In survival, the biggest rule is keep it simple, keep your shelter small, and that way you don't have to spend all day collecting material. So far, this has been about five hours. I don't need a fire for this, which is what's great about it. Hopefully I can get a fire by tonight, if not tomorrow morning, but this is gonna keep me warm and dry regardless if I'm successful getting a fire. For now, I'm gonna move on, probably put a little more work into this before sunset, but right now I need to drink of water. All right, I am really, really psyched. This bowl is actually, was overflowing, um, and I didn't expect that actually. I, I, this has only been about three to four hours since I put this thing down, and um, it was overflowing, got a sip out of it. In retrospect, I guess I should check this every two hours. Generally, I normally chop these things in half, and they seal themselves off, basically clotting and stopping the water. Um, now I'm just kind of putting a little cut into it, and when I do that, it actually seems like it keeps going. So I'm not sure about that, but so far so good with that but i have a huge bowl full of water this is absolutely pure grape water and nothing else so i'm really really psyched um unfortunately i don't have a canteen to bring it back and hopefully i can make one of those kind of soon um or else i just had to keep coming back to the tree to get a drink and drinking it all <sighs> yeah this is great water it tastes like a little mix between grape juice and a little hint of pine in there from the pine bark. So amazing water source with no bacteria. So really psyched this worked out extremely well. I gotta make a bunch more of these bowls. All right, it's been a great day so far and I still actually have some time before sunset. So I'm not counting on it, but I'm gonna get out there and see if in the next hour here, I can crank out a fire. Uh, fingers crossed, if not, then I'll get it going in the morning. All right, so. Got a little while before sunset. What I wanna do is get a really nice dry branch up off the ground. So I'm gonna climb up into this tree. It's dead. And it's also a very non-dense wood, something I can scratch my fingernail across and it makes a nice mark on it. Things like hickory and oak are too dense for bojil woods. And when you scratch them, they don't make a mark. So this is an amazing tree right here. Just gotta get up there and get it. Yeah, this one's perfect, not too rotten. I have some really nice straight sections in this branch. A couple more out there that I'm gonna grab. But from here, yank this guy off. This is amazing bow drill wood right there. While I'm up here, I'm gonna look for a really nice straight branch that's alive because basswood also has amazing cordage. I can make a rope out of this, this type of bark within a couple minutes. And that's gonna work great for a bow drill. All right, so really good branch here, very little knots, and I'm gonna be able to use that section of bark for great cordage. So bojo collection is almost complete. It's really that easy. If you get the right size and the right branches, you really don't even have to do very much carving. All right, next up in my bojo is I need tinder so that when I do make a coal by rubbing two sticks together, I can blow it into flame. And I'm gonna do that with really nice, fine little shreds of bark. If you're desperate, you can definitely take pine needles or leaves and crunch them up really, really good by mashing them between two rocks. But this is one of my favorite trees for doing this. Uh, this is a cedar tree. There's tons around here that work good. The poplar trees and everything else around here is amazing, but this stuff lights incredibly well. All right, so I've got my spindle here. I've got an eight inch section that's perfectly straight and nice and dry of this soft wood. I'm gonna drill this eventually into the same piece of uh, tree here um, and I'm gonna split this board down to become my fireboard. So um, basically all I need to do is point the ends of this stick, flatten this one out, and I'm gonna be ready to go after I get my cordage made.
I've got my handhold, which is any old chunk of wood, and I drill a little bit of a hole into it just to divot. It's going to hold the top point of the top point of my spindle. It's going to spin against the bottom fireboard here, but I basically just carved this thing somewhat flat um, on this end here. And so that's my setup. Next thing I need is just a string so that I can spin the spindle. To do that, I'm going to use the basswood branch that I got. I put a little split into it with my knife, and from there I just pull it apart. Now the old basket maker's trick is you want to pull it evenly so that that little split goes right up the middle. So if it tends to run off to one side, that just means you're pulling too hard on that side. So just if it's pulling off to this side, I'm going to pull on the opposite side, and it'll pull that split right back into the middle. Once it's nice and even, I can pull evenly on both sides. Now it's running off to my side a little, so I'm going to pull only on the far side and it'll pull that split right back into the middle. And I do that as long as I can without letting it run out. And that way I'm going to get the longest piece of bark off this piece of basswood. This actually gives me two cords and it's always good to have a backup just in case the one fails just at the last minute. You can quickly wrap up the next one. All right. So this is a nice section here. There's no, to very little to no branches on it. And the bark is really strong. So all I need to do is separate that from the wood. So I'm gonna take this and pull all that inner bark gently away from the wood without putting any rips or tears in it. Try to get a nice section of this. So I'm just gonna evenly Pull that, should come off fairly easily, especially in the spring. This doesn't work as well in the winter with this and you might have to use some other fibers. But in the spring, it just pops right off because there's so much moisture coming up through the bark that it separates from the branch really good. So there's the branch, I can just get rid of that. And this now becomes a strong enough piece of bark to do my bow drill. And now this is really what speeds up the process is using strips of bark rather than having to weave and reverse wrap a fancy cord I can just take a knot and put it at the end of this thing. Tie it up so there's a knot in the end. Now I've got a nice, strong, flexible bow. Piece of hickory here that really has a lot of uh, strength to it so it's not gonna break mid-process. And I put a split right at the top of it. Now I'm gonna take my piece of bark and stick it into that split. And now all I need to do, that's already tied on. I don't need to worry about lashing too much. And I'm gonna take this And basically all I'm gonna do is twist this piece of bark so that all the outer bark is on the inside and the nice inner white bark is on the inside. So I'm making a tube out of this thing. As I do this, I just check for any weird spots, any spots where there's branches or anything like that, make sure they're gone. Hopefully already by now they're gone. And as I tie this up in a tube, this saves me all the trouble of reverse wrapping something else and taking a lot of time with it. And so anywhere I find there's stiff spots, I just really work those areas. And I twist this thing up. Definitely in a race for the sun right now. And I just check for any weird spots, any stiff spots, make sure they're nice and loose and everything's rolling into a tube perfectly. Okay, once I've got that wrapped up, I'm going to now measure it out. I'm gonna take this end and put it right into the split. I'm gonna bend my bow slightly so that even if my cord stretches, the bow is gonna take up some of that slack because it's tense. And if the natural cord stretches, which it almost always does, this bow is gonna keep pulling on it and keep adding pressure. So now I can take that little bit of leftover I have and tie this end up. Sometimes I'll even make two of these just in case I'm real close to getting the fire going and the cord breaks. I've got one waiting and I can just, you know, continue using the heat that I've already built up and all the dust. So this now becomes my bow. Last step is to make sure my tinder's really nice and dry and ready to go. You do that just by buffing it between your hands really good. 
Now the cool thing about this bow is now I can bend it. And that's gonna make it, when I string this thing, it's gonna take the pressure off the cord and put it into the bow so that I don't crank on my cordage too much. And I'm gonna get the bow in there, or the spindle in there. Crank it down. Okay, now you can see my bow is really taut. And it's gonna take up any slack when that cord stretches and keep it nice and tight. Okay, I'm gonna get this in my handhold. I put some pine sap in the top of this handhold. I'm gonna take it slow. I'm gonna angle my bow slightly so the cord doesn't actually rub on itself. That's one of the biggest tricks to keeping your cord from breaking, is to make sure that it doesn't rub on itself. I'm just gonna take it slow and warm it up. I'm gonna make sure the whole kit's working together fluidly before you really start putting too much pressure. Once it starts to smoke and burn itself in, then you can really add the speed and the pressure. But for now, I'm just gonna warm it up. It seems to be working good, so I'm gonna start putting on some pressure and that's where you're gonna see the smoke. I'm canting my bow just slightly to keep the string from rubbing on itself. Looking good so far. Okay, right at the end, I'm just gonna crank out as much speed as I can. Get one last little burst. Okay, I've got a coal. So when your kit is done right, it goes pretty well, and that type of bark cordage is so strong. All right. Now I'm gonna let it sit. You don't wanna be all concerned and kind of fumble it all up, so I just let it sit on my wood chip. Let the heat spread throughout that dust, but you can see that it's still lit. And now I'm going to flip it over. It's not windy out, so I'm not too worried, but if, I, if it was, I'd really be careful flipping this into the tinder bundle. <sighs> Fingers crossed. It'd be so nice to get a fire going tonight. So let it sit in there for a little second. It's not a huge rush, but I want to keep that heat centralized right in the middle of the bird's nest and I'm going to blow right on the hottest spot while pinching this fiber in on the coal. This is some pretty good tinder, so it should go up quick. The more it smokes, the more harder you blow through it. There we go. Such a good feeling. Uh, I'm gonna have a fire tonight. So super relieved, gonna throw that in my teepee. All right, there we go. So it goes right in there. All I need to do is just shove it right into the little doorway that I made. And ideally, this is just gonna catch all the tinder that I have in there, that fluffed up bark. Little air really helps it spread, but ideally this is just gonna spread on its own if I've done everything correctly. Definitely not too many times in a survival situation can you actually fully relax, but if you're at the stage at the first or second day and you get your fire, definitely time to kick back and just kind of give yourself a little bit of break. And you know at this point that all you have to do is concentrate on food. There's a ton of edible plants out here. It's gonna be the bulk of my diet and hopefully I'll be able to trap a couple animals and get some protein as well. All right, I woke up this morning and walked down to the lake and noticed a baby beaver collecting plants and bringing them back into his lodge. I sat there for a while watching him, but then realized that I needed to do the same. All right, 
So as always in a survival situation, when I'm gathering debris, it's when I tend to find some really cool stuff. So I already have a bunch of grubs I can use for fishing. I found some deer bone that I can use for knives or fish hooks. And right now I stumble upon some wild ramps. And this plant here is fantastic for eating. The entire thing's edible. All I have to do is dig down in the ground, pry them up, and pull out the plant by the base. And it's got this great little onion bulb at the end of it. It has a very garlicky onion flavor. So if I scrape off all the dirt and outer sheath with my knife, you'll see that there's just this fantastic onion bulb in there. And I can add that to my cooked greens or I can just eat it right now as is. So there's a ton of them around here. Every patch I come upon, I can take about a third without disturbing it, but this is a great edible plant and it's definitely gonna keep my energy up throughout this trip. Really good. All right, well, I can't show you every single edible plant that I'm eating while I'm out here because a lot of it's just grab and go. One of the main staples I'm gonna have in the spring in this area is gonna be the fiddlehead. Um, these are the uncurled ferns that are still wrapped up in little spirals. These are great to eat. The best is the ostrich fern, um, but this is called the cinnamon fern. And as long as I boil it, it burns off any carcinogens that's in the plant and it tastes amazing. It's like asparagus. So I'm gonna go through the swamp and collect a ton of these. It's gonna be a, a huge staple for the week out here. This plant here is called burdock. If you dig down and follow the stem all the way down, it's a little bit of a pain, but sometimes, especially the ones that are real deep, are huge, big carrots. And so this one, if you get down there, get it out gently. Um, this has got a big root on the end of it, almost like dandelion, um, sometimes way bigger, but this is also a great edible root and burdock is amazing. You spent all day collecting these, you'd have enough starch and calories from burdock to keep going. Great one to know. All right, another great plant in the eastern woodlands, garlic mustard. Garlicky, oniony kind of a taste to it, but it's really good when you mix it in with other stuff, but um, really good edible to know garlic mustard all over the eastern woodlands. This is stinging nettle. There's a ton of it out here, and um, if I just collect the top of it, by really carefully not touching the stingers, only touching the top of the leaf and folding it, and then cutting it. Um, this top here, I can boil this up or cook it up and the heat gets rid of the sting and the stinger, so you don't have to worry about it. An amazing edible plant. You should definitely know stinging nettle. Nice. Looks like it's time to weave some fishing line. Thanks to my friend, the beaver who made this dam over here. All those bass are trapped in this little area. And all I need to do is either trap them or fish them out. All right, out in the woods, most plants are made of some sort of fiber. Some are strong, some are weak, some are great for using for bow drill. The tree bark I used on the bow drill is incredibly strong, but it is actually is really stiff um, compared to plants like this, which is dogbane. This makes an amazing core that doesn't stiffen up when it dries. It's kind of like a cottony thread. And so for fishing line, I really want that quality. So I'm gonna go around and collect a ton of dogbane. Luckily in this field, there's a bunch of it. So I can just break it down at the base, pull it up out of the ground. And then when I break the base of it, there's a ton of really, really good fibers that come off of this. And these super long fibers are really strong. I'm gonna weave them together very thinly, and that's gonna make an incredible fishing line. All right, now's the time to relax and weave some rope. In survival, the biggest rule is you're always doing something, never just sitting around. But projects like this is when you can relax, disappear into nature, and let yourself start to blend into your environment. To make fishing line, I first separate the bark from the woody part of the dog vein. This leaves me with the outer bark and the fibrous inner bark. To separate the fibers, I rub the bark between my hands, leaving only the long fibers. Sitting still silently in the woods is one of the best ways to see your surroundings and experience nature undisturbed. This is a perspective most people never take the time to experience. Once you have long fibers, you separate them into two groups. 
You spiral each strand around the other in a clockwise circle while twisting each strand individually counterclockwise. This creates tension is what holds the spiraling strands together and makes the individual fibers much, much stronger. So definitely learning, I gotta get these things on there really, really good. So here's my half a grub. I really wanna like have the string lined up with the toggle, have both pointy ends poking out, but not too much. I really wanna encourage the fish to come in and nab this thing whole, not just try to take a little piece and run away with it. So I gotta make the entire thing look very, really able to be swallowed in one big bite because I want this gaff going all the way down as far as possible to work. So I'm just gonna do just like that. That should do it. All right, fishing was frustrating. I lost a ton of fish and a lot of bait. Fortunately, I did eventually get a few. They're going for it. Dude, they go right away for this bit. Come on, swallow it. Oh shit, I got one right there. Right there, nice, looks nice. Oh shit. Oh, oh, Stan, nice, look at that. I got one, yeah. There he is. Make sure he's on camera. Right there. Nice. Totally swallowed it deep. Nice. Oh, sweet. So there's number one. Get back to land. Oh my god. That's so cool. All right, they're definitely going for these grubs. So here we go. It's like right there. It's cop off and out his gill. He swallowed that thing deep. That's really cool. All right, number one. Hopefully I can get a bunch more. Got another one, I think. Get nibbles. Oh, got him, got him, got him, got him. Right there, nice. Check it out. Oh, it's caught right through his mouth. Perfect. Right there. All right. One more dose. All right, I got him. Right there, right there. Oh shit, there's a bass. Nice. Yeah, this is an actual meal. Oh, well, look at this guy. This is working out so good. Look at this. Oh, no, 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 no. I gotta get him back to shore. Go, go, do not come off. Come on, come on, come on. Nice. Look at that. Now that's a meal. Definitely gonna eat great tonight. And uh, if I can just keep doing this, I'm gonna be fine. So stoked. Let's take a look. Way down there, can't even see. Where is he? There it is, come on. Yeah, it's way down there. This guy swallowed this thing. I think that's the difference with the bass is they just strike for it while the sunnies try to like nab your bait away, but I got this guy good. Basically, this is gonna be uh, my staple for the entire time that I'm here is these fish. So it's a great little area, super awesome. How it's all plugged off by the uh, dam that the muskrat or the beaver made and a uh, great little spot. I could probably fish out here for a long time and keep myself really well fed. Um, I smashed his head in, so he shouldn't be feeling any more pain, but what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna clean him out and gut him first. So I'm gonna take my knife and just around the butt hole area, I'm gonna try to keep my knife clean, and I'm gonna slice just under the skin here, all the way up to where it gets near the mouth. Try not to puncture all the innards, just wanna, oop. Oop, I'm dead, just as I said that. But you wanna just slice right up the skin, be real gentle. Sneak your knife under there. And slice all the way up to here. All right, from there, guts should come out in a nice even package if you do it well. 
and they're gonna terminate at the end, you know, at the exit hole there. So I'm gonna pull this guy apart. There's all his guts. Now animals are only made up of bones, meat, and guts. So as long as I get rid of all the guts, I'm just left with bones and meat, which is perfect. So I'm gonna reach in. I could cut the head off or I could leave it on if I just reach in and grab right around the esophagus thing. And I could yank that out and the guts will come out in a nice, neat package. So once I've done that, I kind of scoop my fingers in and I have a nice gut pile. Probably shouldn't use my seat for this, but I can get another one. So here we go. Nice neat gut pile, cleaned out the majority. You can kind of pick through it. You can wash it out with some water. You're gonna cook it anyway, so even water from the stream isn't that dangerous. Now, I generally don't eat the liver. I really like to save that for bait, and so this is gonna become a bait pile. I'll use it for a trap for a raccoon or a possum or maybe a turtle. Um, but this fish at this point, I can just stick a stick through him, hold him above my fire, and he's just gonna roast up and I'm just gonna be left with bone, skin, and meat. Just like that. And that'll be a fantastic meal right there. All right, some people might say that I overdid it on these guys, but uh, I definitely, I'm a big fan of making sure to just overcook things in a survival situation. Oh, look at that, amazing. Oh, it's gonna be so good. Um, the edibles, the wild edibles, have been doing really well. Got tons of them out here, but really, when you're putting out a ton of energy um, in a survival situation, you can eat tons of wild edibles and still, I feel like I'm still losing weight, probably am. And so getting some oils and proteins in you gives you this huge burst of energy. It's incredible how much just even a couple fish gives you as far as another day or two of energy. So I'm um, really stoked on all these fish and looking forward to getting a whole bunch more this week and trying to find some other sources of protein out there. Uh. All right, this is the end of part one. Part two is up on my YouTube page, so check it out.